Love one another as I have loved you. This is the command that Jesus gave his disciples as the way they were to live once he was gone. For us as Catholics, it's the reason that we founded hospitals, schools, shelters. It's the reason that we donate our time, talent, and treasure. Loving one another means doing charitable things. But what if I told you that charity was only half of the story? And that as Christians, charity is incomplete unless it is lived out through justice. When we think about people doing charitable works, feeding the poor, caring for the sick, teaching the underprivileged, most people, no matter how they feel about the church or religion, will inevitably think of a nun in a habit or a priest in a Roman collar. This is partially conditioned by the movies and television we watch. Even in secular media, we often find traditional images of the church appearing when someone is in need. When society crumbles around them or a situation calls for selfless love, there's often a random and unidentified religious there to help. In a lot of ways, these traditional images of the church have become a sort of archetype of charity, even a cliche at times for those helping the poor. And it's no wonder why. For Christians, charity is an essential aspect of living the gospel. Quite simply, the response of disciples to the uh, commandment of Jesus, that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so part of the task of being a disciple or one might say the measure of being a disciple is not only love of God, but also love of neighbor, which is charity. Charity is so intrinsic to our faith as Christians and the work we do as Catholics that the organization Catholics Come Home made it the main selling point of its 2009 commercial. With God's grace, we started hospitals to care for the sick. We established orphanages and helped the poor we are the largest charitable organization on the planet, bringing relief and comfort to those in need. We educate more children than any other scholarly or religious institution. Overall, it's a fantastic commercial that highlights our good works, prayerfulness, diversity of members, and positive impact on history. And the organization has done a lot to produce positive and inviting images of the church for a popular audience. And yet there is one aspect of our faith completely missing from it, justice. When we say justice, we're not talking about lawyers and judges. We're not talking about doling out punishments. We're talking about the very biblical notion of giving each one what is rightfully due to them. The whole point about justice is, biblically speaking, it's about living in right relationship with God, with one another, and with creation. So how is this different from charity? It seems to me the whole point of justice is to deal not just with the effects or the outcomes of a situation, but to try to remedy and deal with the causes that bring about painful outcomes or consequences. Think about it this way. Say you go for a walk by the river and you find someone drowning. You decide to dive into the water to save them. In doing so, you have spent your time alleviating the effects of a painful outcome for someone. This is charity. But say this begins to happen a lot and you find yourself diving in the river four or five times a week to save someone. You begin to ask yourself, why are there so many people falling in the river that need saving? And what can I do to stop it from happening in the future? In doing so, you have spent your time alleviating the causes of a painful outcome for someone else. This is justice. In our world around us, there are many people drowning in a sense, dealing with poverty, violence, loneliness, oppression, and fear. As a church, we are obviously called to pull them out of the water of their condition. But we're also called to ask some important questions. What is it in our world that's causing these problems? And what can we do to fix them? Part of the task of us as Christians is simply to be concerned with what, what is the environment? And I don't just don't mean the physical environment, but what is the wider environment in which we are asking people to live their lives? Uh, if we care about people, we should care about the communities that we plant people in. We should care about the environments in which people are growing up. The Catholic Church has an extensive history of doing just that. Theologians like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas thought deeply about what a just society looked like, defining proper uses of money, authentic forms of government, even the conditions under which one could wage war. In the modern era, popes have written what are called social encyclicals, letters meant to be read by the whole church as a guide for building a just society based on the current issues. It is from these letters, built on the foundation of scripture and tradition, that we are guided by seven general principles of social teaching. 
We are called to care for God's creation, that which was created before us and we are a part of, to protect the life and dignity of the human person, to be active members of family and community, the building blocks of society, to uphold the rights and responsibilities of all people, but especially those who are poor, for which we have a preferential option, and those who are workers, all the while remembering that we are all in this together, in solidarity with all the people around the world. What's great about these principles is they are fairly broad categories to live by. The official church rarely, if ever, dictates specific or exclusive ways in which a Catholic is to live in the world because there are plenty of good and faithful ways to live as a Catholic in this world. What the church does dictate, however, is that a life of justice is required of all Christians. The 1971 Synod of Bishops wrote, Action on behalf of justice and participation in the transformation of the world fully appear as constitutive dimension of the preaching of the gospel. Or, in other words, of the church's mission for the redemption of the human race and its liberation from every oppressive situation. And so what we're really saying is, if the Christian community lacks a commitment to justice, it's really not the Christian community, any more than it would be the Christian community if it lacked a commitment to reflection and prayer over the Bible, if it lacked a commitment to celebrate the Eucharist. Just as these things are essential to Christian identity, what the church maintains is being committed to justice has that same essential quality. If you want to be a Christian, you have to be concerned about justice. And how can you blame them? At its core, justice is simply an extension of charity, making sure our societal structures reflect our love for all people. There's nothing inherently controversial about seeking justice. Each of these principles is clearly rooted in scripture and our tradition. And while we may disagree on how we are to live these things out, there shouldn't be a debate that we should. But really, is there anything not controversial in our world? I beg you, look for the words social justice or economic justice on your church website. If you find it, run as fast as you can. Social justice and economic justice, they are code words. If you have a, a priest that is pushing social justice, go find another parish. Go alert your uh, bishop and tell them, excuse me, are you down with this whole social justice thing? Everyone's fine with a nun handing out bread or a priest blessing the sick. But when someone begins talking about structures of sin or systems of injustice, eyebrows begin to rise. As Cardinal Dom Elder Camara, former Brazilian Archbishop, once said, When I give to the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why they are poor, they call me a communist. These sorts of questions challenge the status quo, and people with power, status, and privilege tend to like the status quo. When something challenges it, in their minds, it can't be true religion. While I can't speak to the exact reason that Glenn Beck finds social justice to be so antithetical to living the gospel, I can say that there is a common objection I hear from time to time. If the world will eventually pass away, shouldn't we be focused on saving souls, not the world? And I completely agree. Sort of. Well, I would remind us that we're not just souls. We are embodied spirits. If God becomes human and enters into the material conditions of humanity, if God takes on a body, if God lives the lives that you and I live as material creatures in history, we ought not to be too cavalier about being unconcerned about history or unconcerned about material conditions or unconcerned about the well-being of embodied people because that's precisely what God entered into. Exactly. Ultimately, we may be souls seeking salvation, but we know no existence without a body. Everything we do, everything we know, everything we believe is the result of living in this physical world. Sometimes the physical world can be oppressive, painful and without love, inhibiting our ability to authentically develop into the person God created us to be and effectively hiding the kingdom of God in our midst. In taking on flesh, Jesus did not just announce the kingdom of God with words. He made it present with his actions. He fed the poor, healed the sick, cured the blind. Wonderful acts of charity. But he also denounced the oppression of the religious leaders, included those who were excluded, and challenged the corruption of wealth. Jesus loved us in our physical reality and called us to do the same, through charity and through justice. Thanks to Father Ken Himes for sharing wisdom on this issue. What I share was just the tip of the iceberg of our conversation. There was simply too much good stuff to fit in one video. If you're interested in learning more about Catholic social teaching or where you can read some of the social encyclicals yourself, 
check out the USCCB's website. Finally, if you haven't done it yet, click here to subscribe to the Breaking in the Habit YouTube channel, here to see what I've been writing lately on my blog, and follow me on Facebook, Casey Cole OFM.